Alrighty, so our next speaker is Charlotte O'Neill Dunn. He is the director of the University of Vermont Spatial Analysis Laboratory, um, and his team specializes in using remote sets data to help manage the support. Great, thanks so much. So, as you heard, I'm going to talk about drones, or the technical term that we use, unmanned aerial systems. And Jim Duncan gave me a list of all attendees for this session. And so really, this is just going to be a slideshow of really embarrassing drone things. So all of you doing things you didn't know in your life. <laughs> no, so we became really interested in using better technology that would sort of allow us to sort of break this cycle where we don't really often use remotely sensed data, all this great imagery and stuff that we collect to make more informed decisions, especially rapidly. <coughs> so if you think about things, we're really, really good at data collection. Right? We, we collect an awful lot of data, especially from aerial and satellite platforms. We're pretty good about preparing that data and getting it into a form that, that people can use. You know, some, sometimes we do analysis. In academia, if we're really motivated, which means for the first few years when we're up in tenure, we might even write a publication about it. But how often do we use all these wonderful remotely sensed data sets that we spend money on to actually make decisions, and particularly to make those decisions in a dynamic and rapidly changing landscape? So at UVM, we've formed what we call our Unmanned Aircraft Systems Team, our UAS team, and we specialize in using these lightweight, very, very high-tech drones to gather mapping grade imagery of our landscape. I mean mapping grade data that we can bring into our geographic information systems and make measurements from. So these aren't just attaching a GoPro camera to your drone and flying around and taking pictures. This is ortho-rectified imagery that we can make that are 2D and you'll see some 3D measurements from. So I'd like you to take, take you through a case study here. We're going to go down to Plainfield, Vermont. And the town of Plainfield has an issue here. They've got this bridge over Brook Road there, the Great Brook that tends to run into some issues. What they've got is a situation where they've got a stream, the Great Brook, that really has an awful lot of woody debris in it, right? And there you can see one of the piles, and you have these big storms that come in. And when those big storms come in, that woody debris moves downstream, clogs the bridge, water finds a way around that clog, and causes tremendous damage, sometimes in the five figures, sometimes in the six figures to their infrastructure. And with UAS or our drones, we can go out and, of course, map the damage to these things. But really, what towns like Plainfield are interested in is hiring firms, firms like Bonnery Broom here, to sort of do bridge redesign. So they came to us with sort of three very interesting questions, right? And these questions had to be answered in a short time frame. Right? This is not your higher graduate student and figure this out over you know, four, five, six, ten years, however long it takes them like me to finish their grad degree. So they came to us like, how much woody debris do we have, right? Where is it located? And then what happens to it during these major events? And of course, we could send people out here to do this, but this is actually really dangerous. And there's someone who nearly died one time getting trapped out there during measuring this woody debris during these storms. And it's also really painfully slow, right? If you want to get something like a woody debris inventory of a stream, and you want to do it on regular a regular basis. We're not talking just once a year, once every few years, but perhaps every few weeks, and especially to get in there right after a storm and see what happened before that storm and what happened after that storm. So this was a really good use case for these drone, for drone technology. And so what we did is from December 2014 to July 2015, we set up this monitoring plan. And actually, this is still ongoing. And we flew 12 missions over that time. So we're constantly monitoring this stream and waiting for one of these big events. And that big event happened in July. So I'm going to take you through sort of some of the tools that we developed, and really the entire workflow to give you some insight into how this works. So like I said, we use, let me back out here for a second, sorry. We use these lightweight unmanned aircraft systems. Uh, you see that there's a battery in there, with the ion battery. There's just a simple digital camera, the kind that we used to have before we had smartphones. And it's powered by this electric brushless motor. This thing it's about that big and weighs 1.6 pounds. Really, really safe to operate. Incredibly high tech. It's got this pitot tube here. So this is what's on all other aircraft. So it will adjust to ensure it's taking the photograph at exactly the right angle. And it's got GPS and download links and all that type of stuff. So really, really high tech. This runs you, even though it's a flying piece of styrofoam, um, about $25,000. So it's, it's, not, it's not cheap. All of that is the software driving it. And just to give you an idea, we put together some videos here that sort of shows you operations. So this is launch operations. We just throw it up in the air. Once it's in the air, we're not flying this thing. 
we're all too old in our lab, we didn't play enough video games, and so it's doing this autonomously. It's getting up and it's capturing these images based on a predefined flight plan. All we're doing on the ground is monitoring it, and we have fun trying to see if we can land it right in the backstop. There, <laughs> four points. Um, when, when, we, um, when we finish, what we've got are hundreds of individual still photos. Okay, so these are just images, they've got geo tags with them, but then we run this high end photogrammetric software that stitches all of these photos together. So at any point on the Earth's surface for which we capture imagery, we've typically got four, five, six, seven, maybe eight photos contributing to that area. So this ensures that we've got complete coverage in the area, but also because we've got different perspectives, we can build 3D models, which as you'll see soon is pretty impressive and allows us to do some very neat 3D measurements. So let's talk about the brain imaging later. And so there's some very simple stuff that we can do within our GIS software, but the great thing about this imagery is it's very, very, very high resolution. So we can go into these areas and take a look at things like string channel change and where the wooded debris moved and how big it is and all these types of things. And so we're talking about images that are 10 times better resolution than something like your Vermont orbit photos. Okay? So we're working with data here that's either sort of three or four centimeter resolution data. So we're able to do things like very detailed wooded <coughs> inventory within streams that you can't see on any other imagery out there. It's just too cool. So you're not going to see it on your high resolution promotional imagery. You're not going to see it on your state ortho photos. And furthermore, none of those have the temporal resolution that we do, which means we're constantly sort of monitoring this place every time that we fly. So we can build these very, very robust databases. And in addition, we've got these great 3D models that we produce. Now we're able to produce these 3D models, like I said, because we have these overlapping images. And so these 3D models, if you've seen LiDAR data, they look a lot like LiDAR data, but they're not quite the same because this is just from photos, so we don't have a laser that penetrates the canopy. But still, they're very compelling to look at, if nothing else. And we can use our fancy software here to say, go into a particular location, take a look at some woody debris, and then make some 3D measurements from it. So not only do we know if the debris is still there or not, but we can go in and actually do some profiles of that to get the approximate size of these debris piles. And here we're plotting out one of those. And these 3D models are made of all these tiny little points, much like the LiDAR data set. And that's how we can measure the height from them. So then some other tools that we've developed, like I said, to sort of go beyond from just collecting data and analyzing data to decision support, Go ahead and we built some web map, web map viewers for the area here. So here we are, we're in an online web map. Uh, we've got all our UAS imagery loaded in there, so from before and after the flood event. So people can turn that on and off. This is publicly available, anyone can use it. And then they can go ahead and turn on our debris inventory. So we've got all these little dots that represent the debris that we've inventoried at various time periods, and people are able to tell if that piece of debris is still there or not. I think this is pretty valuable information. And then we also went ahead and took this degree information and we aggregated it up to stream segments. So we divided the Great Brook into these various segments, and we'll see here in a little bit. And then what we've done for these segments is summarize the amount of debris, both pre and post event. So this really gives the town and all the people there and folks who are interested in what happens to wooden debris and streams a remarkable data set, of very, very high spatial <coughs> from our UAS imagery, but also high control resolution. Various measurements. This is what I mean, that stream segment there. So you can click on a stream segment and find out all sorts of information about the woody degree and how much is there. So then we can provide some just useful summary statistics from it because we've gathered all this data and this is really sort of what the town is interested in. And so here we're looking at these small piles, sort of one to five trees, and this is what happened to them in <coughs> June to July. So this is pre-storm and then post-storm, and what we can see in the Great Brook is really interesting here that most of these small piles, they were just completely gone from their current location. So they either moved downstream into the Winooski River or they moved somewhere else. And we also see there's this massive influx of new debris. You see that some didn't change at all, and these are typically higher up on the slopes where the floodwaters didn't pick, and then we have some gained debris and some lost debris. And then we have some additional data here on the large piles. So the large piles are often more armored, right? They've got sediment and rocks in there that are a bit harder to move. 
And so we saw we had eight new, very, very large piles. These are six or more trees in them from the storm. No change of seven, and then some other stats there. So really informative information to the town as they figure out what to do, because they weren't sure during these storm events how much woody debris was coming through that bridge. And we think it's probably hundreds of pieces of woody debris. A few dozen are probably getting hauled up there and causing your problems. But they need to be able to build a bridge that's going to be able to sustain hundreds of pieces of woody debris during a major flooding event, especially if it's something like Irene. Now, it's good to do things from remotely sensed data, but sometimes we still need to get out to the field. And so what we did in this case is we built a mobile app. And what that mobile app allows us to do is allows us to have the UAS imagery, so the imagery from our drone out there. And then in addition to that, we've got all those individual locations of the wooden debris. So our team can go out to verify that the measurements that we made from our data hold true. And we had a big sort of mapping party with people from the town this fall where we built this mobile lab. And they all went out and they were really, really happy at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Who so, used the app? Was that, was that yours? So, yeah, so we, we built the app. It's built on a platform that's known as, as Fulcrum, um, which is one of our partners on this project. And then we uh, sent a bunch of our team out there, and also some folks from the town as well went out. And so, like I said, had the UAS imagery in there there, so that was the extra basis. And then we had all the data that we derived from all the point locations of the Woody debris. And it was GPS enabled, so as you went over a specific piece of Woody debris, it would pop up and say, this is what the readout was from the imagery, and you can verify it, which is quite So nice. then that becomes a town. It sounds like you trained some of the folks from the town to be able to use that app. Yes, that's right. So the potential is to be able to use that in the future. In the future, yeah. But the best way we still found is really flying the drone over was because it's, I mean, the amount of debris we were able to map with, I think we had 13 people out there, and then we got like, I think, probably like an eighth of all debris in this female section in, in a day, so it's really, really low amounts of the monitoring. Yeah, so any, any other questions? I think I've finished way ahead of time, which is always my goal. Yes? Can you program the drone where you want it to go? Yes, yeah, it, you do sort of, for those of you that ever took a uh, aerial photogrammetry clause, it's very similar to old standard flight planning. So we define an area, um, we tell it uh, a few parameters, we sort of say um, what do we want the resolution of the photos to be, how much overlap we want between those photos, more overlap means a better 3D model, what we want the height ceiling to be, so there's all these great parameters, what's our takeoff and landing zone, yeah. and then once we throw it up in the air, I mean it's sort of like Terminator Stein, and it's sort of self-aware, yeah. and it does its own things, and the only time we'll interact with it is if something goes wrong, and typically, that's we've got some large bird that has expressed interest in it. We have to take, take evasive action, and that's, that's, uh, that's happened. Yes? So, there's been a lot of talk about managing drones in the air. Do you also have to file flight plans, or is there any kind of restrictions or regulations that you have? There's, to there's a lot of regulations, yes. Yeah, so, for the FAA right now, what they deem commercial use of drones, we're doing it for recreational purposes. It's, it's almost a free for all out there. Uh, there's some key ones like stay away from airports, uh, the big ones like Burlington, so do not fly on UVM's campus without calling the airports. And then there's other things like height ceiling, we have someone to send someone to flight school to make them a licensed pilot, all these things that are pay a law firm to file paperwork with the FAA to get approval. So there's an awful lot of things that you have to do in order to be able to, to fly drones in the airspace. That being said, if you build like an ultralight glider and put a lawnmower engine on it, I think you can fly that up to a thousand feet with no regulations. So it's sort of a funny world out there. Well, are you operating as a commercial flyer or as a recreational flyer? Uh, we operate as, we're operating under commercial guidelines. Uh -huh. So, so you, have to, commercial guidelines, you have to do all that. Which are the Yes. Did you ever have instances where you had like trouble spots where debris would wash away, but then we could use stuff that we collect and like, figure out how much left and how much came? Yeah, so what, it's, it's a good question. What we're not doing, of course, is tracking individual pieces of debris and where they end up because it's just too yeah. difficult. They, the stuff sort of all looks the same. So it's, it's highly possible that uh, you have things moving, but when we look at divided into these stream segments, that was the really telling point where even you have like the segments right before the bridge where you have dozens of pieces of debris that were just gone post the storm. That was really the indicator for us that most of this stuff is actually flushing probably through the system in these major events. And what's nice about our data, it's so high resolution, you can even see the large rocks in the stream that are moving during these events. And we get very, very fine scale channel change 
all of that becomes available. So all these things that we used to spend so much time doing geomorphic assessments, I mean, we can get out in a, in a morning and have high resolution <coughs> for, for three miles of streams and do that on a regular basis in a much, much more efficient and comprehensive manner. Yeah. Uh, speaking of your high resolution, I'm wondering on file size and data processing, basically, do you need a supercomputer to uh, yeah, so um, it's, it's, it's capturing the data and sort of doing the drone work is the easy part. It's, it's processing it into these photos. We have a $25,000 computer that ensures that after we fly, we can get this imagery out to people either the same day or the next day. And a lot of this was driven by the desire to be available as a resource if we have another type I, I read event. The other thing is that although the might seem like we're, we're flying small areas, um, we've done 350 flights so far, and I think we're up to 17 terabytes of data. So, uh, so it's, it's massive, and, and, you, and the, the buying the drone is the small part of the thing. It's building your team's experience and building that IT backbone, which is much, much more important than what people often go wrong. I'd love to use that secret. <laughs> <laughs> small fee associated with it. Yes. I might have missed at the beginning, but uh, where does your funding for this work come from? Uh, we actually got it from Department of Transportation. So I was telling some folks before, like, Oftentimes, for natural resources, people look to four-letter agencies, but four-letter agencies never get funded, like NASA budget cuts, USDA budget cuts. Then we started thinking CIA never get their budget cut, DOD never get the budget cut. Who else is out there? DOT doesn't get the budget. So we went to them, and what's really nice is, although this was an environmental monitoring project, it fits in nicely with DOT because in Vermont, our streams and our transportation network are just so tightly linked. And so monitoring our streams and understanding our streams is crucial to managing our transportation network. One more. Yeah. Um, you know, it's pretty common practice for state and federal agencies to go in after major storm events and do debris clearing on their streams and rivers. And a lot of that's been focused on removing the large woody debris piles. Was, am I correct in that your information was suggesting that those are fairly stable and it's actually the smaller debris piles? That yeah, I mean, we've done this for, for this, this one storm that, that they had, which was not an Irene event. I mean, it was, it was, I think, about six inches of rain overnight. So it was pretty substantial, but it wasn't quite as big as Irene. And those things certainly tend to be more stable because they are, they do seem to be hardened. And that's what's really nice is that because we didn't just really have any data before of what happens to these things before streams, and now we have this regular data on the Great Brook, and we can monitor it during small events, medium-sized events, and we have another Irene event, and they 